Hi, I'm Daniel Fontaine, co-host of BC Polytalk. And I'm Bill Tillman. Daniel, Tuesday was budget day. I went over there with our camera operator mm -hmm. and it was really interesting. Number one, it's the first time in my 63 years, because it was my birthday, wow. that I became a TV reporter. <laughs> and I actually found that the power of a camera and a microphone is actually quite interesting, having been a print reporter for low these many years and also done radio and TV commentary, but never as a reporter. So we're in the media budget lockup for budget 2020, the BC provincial budget, and we're in the media lockup area. Carol James, the finance minister, will come in. She will come to this podium and speak to the media. And if we step around the podium for the moment, we'll see a stronger BC for everyone is all over as the theme for the budget, a balanced plan to keep BC moving forward. Budgets are about choices, and Budget 2020 is a balanced plan. It continues to advance the fundamental changes our government has been making for the people of British Columbia, different choices than the past government. We're repairing the damage that their choices created, and we're fixing the problems facing families today. The changes we've made are all about making people's lives better today, and creating opportunities that will last a lifetime. The budget is one of the biggest events in the BC Poly year, obviously. Uh, we have the throne speech the week before, which gives a general idea what the government's going to do. Mm -hmm. And then the budget spells out the financial details. You've been to many lockups. I've been to many lockups. You and I have been locked up together, we so have. to speak, <laughs> many times. Uh, what's your impression of how the media lockup and the stakeholder lockup works? Yeah, so the way it works is for those people who've never been through it, and actually I would say the vast majority of British Columbians hopefully. have never, yeah. hopefully never been through a lockup, <laughs> but you get there early in the morning, you're going to have a bunch of stakeholders, a lot of uh, industry associations are there, uh, all, pretty much all the media from around the province are there. Uh, usually it's at the convention center in downtown Victoria, not far, just across from the legislature. People will gather and then around nine o'clock, I think they, they lock the doors, literally. They take away your cell phone, I think they block the Wi-Fi. It is, it is in lockdown mode. And the reason they do that is because there's very sensitive information in that budget. And so they're allowing you to see that information in advance of the public seeing it in the afternoon. So you see this real crazy like hive of activity as soon as they hand out the budget documents everyone's grabbing the usbs popping it in their laptop and you're trying to if you're a stakeholder to search your name or search a particular item or issue that impacts you so it's quite the quite the thing and then around i think around 1 30 or so they unlock the doors allow you to get your cell phone back and then you just see a ton of news releases and and stuff going out on air yeah that's right and of course here's uh we'll use a little prop here's this year's budget document uh, a stronger bc for everyone uh, and uh, there is the entire thing on uh, on a little clip, a little plug-in USB drive. And then we've got, oh, a massive, here we are. We've got an absolute mitful of news releases that I collected while I was in the lockup from various groups. Behind us, there's a wall behind us and we're just gonna walk around this way. And behind the wall, interestingly enough, the Berlin Wall here are all of the stakeholders, community groups, businesses, labor, uh, all sorts of associations who are interested here, probably two or 300 people back there. Those walls will be open for questioning of Carol James, then they'll be closed, and then they'll open again so that the media can interview all the community stakeholders and get their opinion on the budget. One of the reasons that there is a lockup is because there can be tax information in the budget. And indeed, in this budget, there were two taxes mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, a new tax on the top 1%, uh, kind of hard to avoid your income if you've already. I know, Bill. You're gonna have heard to pay about a little that bit one. more now. Uh, you know, well, I was, I, no, let's not go there, Daniel. I don't want to. I was thinking of putting that on you. Oh, okay. uh, and secondly, there was a pop tax, yes. a tax on sugared carbonated drinks. Well, so, actually, no. Let's be careful. It's not just on sugared carbonated drinks. It's actually on Coke Zero, Diet Pop. Yes. It's on all pop. So it actually is a pop tax. It's not a, a yeah. not a sugar tax. That's why I call it confusion. I call it a pop tax. You but do. Well, sugary so, pop tax. So, <laughs> so if you are a major shareholder with billions of dollars invested in Coke and Pepsi, and you found out early, you might dump your shares. Now that's an unlikely one, but in previous budgets, both federal and provincial, we have seen tax measures that actually had a fairly yes. significant impact. So that's why you can't communicate with the outside world. Yeah, and, and Bill, I did see you. You did a fantastic job uh, being Thank a reporter. You. I know that uh, Keith Baldry was looking and over his shoulder, wondering <laughs> if uh, you know he might have uh, 
some uh, job security issues there at Global. So good <laughs> job for you. But um, so uh, you and I have both been to many of these lockups. How did you, what was the sense? I didn't get to go this time. So what was the sense inside the room that you said there were fewer people there than normal from mm -hmm. the media side? Mm -hmm. Anything else besides that that uh, struck you as being interesting? Well, you know, we do have a shrinking media, unfortunately. And uh, you and I both believe the more ver uh, voices, the more mm -hmm. diverse voices, the better. But you could definitely see that the media is shrinking. Uh, there were only four CBC tables instead of the usual five or six. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, there were fewer people there. Uh, this was a flat uh, mood in that room. There, there was nothing in the budget that was really startling beyond, uh, well, even I wouldn't say startling. The one percent tax on our on our richest British Columbians and the pop tax were the two stories that were kind of coming out of there. Mm -hmm. um, I would say this was a very low impact budget. We'll see later. I asked a question of Finance Minister Carol James or whether this was an election That's budget right. or an election uh, a budget that she could find an election on it, and she kind of, as with most of the questions, she kind of dodged it. But mm -hmm. pretty clearly, the mood in there was there's not going to be an election this year unless it happens by accident. That was an excellent question, by the way, and I think that um, when you look back at the throne speech and the budget combined, you can't see an election in either one of those documents. So uh, I, I'm assuming the NDP are kind of rolling the dice and assuming that uh, Andrew Weaver and the Greens are going to continue to support them at least through till next spring, and that that will likely be the time uh, for the, the goodies to come out. But, you know, we can talk about that in today's podcast around the strategy and the timing on that. Mm -hmm. You know, previous governments, uh, a lot of governments have waited until that spring budget. But remember, we have our fall election now, so we'll have a spring budget and a four, five, six months in between that budget time and the election. So, yeah, we've got now a fixed election date and uh, the NDP uh, government moved it, I think, with the agreement of the other parties from usual uh, fixed election date of May into October so that the budget can be verified so that nobody and God forbid anyone do this. They would claim the balance. Budget, budget, was, budget. The budget was balanced. <laughs> they would claim all sorts of things were happening. And then when the books actually were checked later, it turned out not to be the case. Now, that does not necessarily prohibit a government from going early. But uh, by October, that will presumably the budget will be pretty clear whether mm -hmm. how accurate it was. And also if the financial circumstances have changed since the projections. So, Bill, you interviewed a lot of people. Let's get to it. I know there's a lot of people, a lot of folks that you talk to have some very interesting things to say about the budget. So we'll be right back. BC Poly Talk thanks Harbor Air for supporting the show. It's through sponsorship and viewer support that we get to produce this show. Vaughn, uh, we're just doing a little hit here. I don't think you're going to be able to make the case that this is a budget put out by a government that's planning an early election. I think you'd say the same with the throne speech. That um, this is much more consolidation. A, a good example is the child care plan, right? Yeah. Which is the first three years, it was a big deal. The amount of funding is the same. They're still hitting 22,000 yeah. spaces, which is a lot, but it's not an increase. It's yeah. essentially stay the course. Now, you know, when an election, when they really are thinking of an election this time next year or whatever, you might see you know, new targets in that in all that area. The, um, the wealth tax is significant. It's another, it's the second one they've done, and it'll get some attention. But On a scale of one to 10 in terms of impact, what would, with 10 is earth shattering and one is nothing? This is nothing like the first three NDP budgets. Those were the, those were the big news budgets. And I think the next one, you know, I think of next, this time next year, probably an election year, um, that one will be really interesting. But, I think this is consolidation and understandable, you know. So, Bill, um, uh, Vaughn clearly doesn't think this is an election budget. I think he probably is in the majority when it comes to the media. Uh, you know, clearly, when you look at the throne speech and you look at what's in the budget or not in the budget, uh, one could easily be led to believe that the NDP are hoping the election is sometime in 2021. Yeah, we'll have another budget then. But, you know, Daniel, I took what Vaughn Palmer had to say, and then I thought, let's put that question directly to Carol James, the finance minister herself. Here's my question and her answer. Hi, Minister Bill Tielman, bcpolytalk.ca. Um, this looks like a very solid budget, and clearly you have once again uh, got a surplus in it, a, a narrow surplus, but it doesn't look to me like an election budget. And I'm wondering, given the tight minority situation, the fact that there's some instability in the Green Party and the Andrew Weaver leaving, if you faced an election this year, would you be comfortable going to the people with this budget? Well, you know, we have an election, fixed election date, as you know, uh, a year and a half from now. That's certainly what I'm working towards. Uh, but I think it really shows once again 
again, that as a government, we set a plan for ourselves, not based on when an election might be, not based on whether we're going to head to the polls in six months or a year. I think we far surpassed the uh, expiry date that most people believed a minority government would ever see. Uh, we've much surpassed that in moving into our third year. We focused on making sure that we delivered what we promised the people of British Columbia which was affordability, which was improving services. And that's what this budget is about. So yes, I'm very proud of this budget, whether uh, we face an election today or whether we face an election a year and a half from now, which is what I expect. Uh, I think this is a budget that shows the people of British Columbia. We were focused when we came in on putting the people at the heart of all of our work, including the budget. And we've done that again in this budget. So no big surprise there. We didn't really expect Finance Minister Carol James to announce either the election is on or that there's going to be a giant announcement after the budget, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I spoke with Keith Baldry about this uh, before Carol James spoke. And again, the mood is definitely not an election budget. Yeah, no, I, I I think that, you know, we would have seen something and I think even the signal in the throne speech would have been there. And this is clearly a government that wants to govern for another year and they're going to try to produce a budget that doesn't really uh, anger too many people, you know, tries to kind of be in the middle there. And I think they've 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 done that in this budget. Yeah. So let's hear Keith Baldry explain his view on this from Global TV. So we're here with Keith Baldry. Uh Legislative Bureau Chief for Global TV News. Keith, you've been doing this for a long time. I've been doing this for a long time. Are you finding anything interesting, particularly in this budget? I always find budgets interesting because there's, it's jam-packed with information. It really explains where the government's priorities are, you know, what to expect in the coming year. The budget very much is covered throughout the whole year. We're going to see a lot of announcements that are incorporated in this, but they're going to be trotted out. I think they're called echo announcements. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we're going to see that over the course of the year. Having said that, there's not a lot of surprises in this budget, and, and that in itself is not a surprise. Um, the, the sugar tax, I guess, is a sexy uh, headline on this thing. But um, I view it basically as almost a stand pat budget, except for what one deputy described it to me. This is a caseload budget. If, yeah. if you've got rising caseload, whether it's enrollment in schools, right. uh, social right. service cases, right. uh, coupled with um, basically our population keeps increasing. So the, the pressure on the system in terms of government services continues to increase. And that's what's getting the spending increase in this budget. But by and large, the rest of the government is, is frozen or stand pat okay. situation. And this, if I remember rightly, is the first time the health care budget's gone over $21 billion. In fact, $22 billion, if you can believe it. Last night on the on Global, I said it's going to exceed $21 billion. Well, I was right, but I had the wrong number. It's over $22 billion, a $1.3 billion increase in a single year, which is extraordinary. Now, I checked uh, with the, the civil servants on this. The, a big chunk of that in, uh, unanticipated increase from last year is uh, for, to pay for the doctor's contract and the nurse's contract, about $500 million. That was not in the fiscal plan last year. So that's a, that's a big jump in the healthcare yeah. budget. Just for, but you take that aside, it's still a big increase that gets us over $22 billion. And you frame that against uh, basically a cut in spending or frozen spending in 14 other ministries. You can show, you can see just how big a, a drain on the budget healthcare is. Where do you see the BC Liberals and or the Greens in terms of uh, an opposition attack on this budget? Because it looks pretty stand pat, as you say. Yeah, I think it's pretty tame. There's not much there, not much there for the Liberals to get their their heads around. I suppose they could they'll increase some of the tax measures, which are pretty modern, but uh, you can, certainly can't increase the increase in health care uh, from that point of view or government services. They're being expanded and funded, so not a lot there for the opposition to, to dig into. And again, Carol James is a very cautious uh, finance minister, which is a, a good thing in that in that position. So not a big spending spree other than health and I think uh, that's going to be hard for the opposition to deal with. Do you think uh, this obviously doesn't look to me like an election budget in any way shape or form. Do you think next year will be an election budget? Well, you know, the, by, by design, the NDP has taken the election away from the budget window. So usually we'd have a May election following a spring budget. Now the plan is to have it in October, which sort of puts some, some space and distance between budget day and, uh, and, and election day. So I don't think next year's budget is going to necessarily be this, the proverbial election budget. Because again, according to the fiscal plan here, it's a three-year plan. And there's not a lot of new money for next year either. I mean, she's locked in on a fairly conservative path other than social service spending and health care spending. Uh, there's still going to be a lot of capital projects, and those are the big sexy things that people pay attention to at election time. You know, you're going to see John Horgan wearing a hard hat at a bunch of school construction, and that happens in every budget. I'm shocked to hear that. Uh, it also looks to me, or just to, to clarify for our viewers and listeners, uh, the reason why the election was moved from traditionally in May, fixed election date, into October mm -hmm. is because uh, budgets were coming out that could not be verified, that could not be checked and said, yeah. hey, this is balanced or it isn't balanced or the surplus is yes or, or no, exactly. etc. So... Um, do you think the NDP would, will definitely stick with that? 
That, that's a good question. I still think there's a possibility of an election window in the spring of 2021. I think the Greens now without Andrew Weaver there, um, they say they're going to stick to the Confidence of Supply Agreement, not take the NDP down. But the Greens have to find a way to separate themselves from the NDP and not be subsumed by their identity. They've got to carve out their own identity. Maybe that means, you know, voting against the budget next spring. Uh, I'm not sure that's absolutely going to happen, but I think that's a possible window that we could see an election next spring. I'm still betting on the fall of 2021, though. Yeah. Keith Baldry from Global TV, thanks a million. Okay. You know, Daniel, each budget that we've seen depends on, reactions depend on who's in power. So sure. when there's an NDP government, the labor movement tends to be happy with the budget. When there's a BC Liberal government, the business community seems to be happy with the budget and vice versa. Mm. Uh, in this case, we're going to actually take a look at uh, clips from both labor and business. But is that your response to uh, generally the reaction that you had from previous budgets? Yeah, and, and there's another category as well. Those are more the social activists and mm -hmm. they tend to really never be happy with mm -hmm. it's either That's a liberal true. government or a, a, an NDP government. So we're kind of seeing those three groups, but yes, the, typically when the BC Liberal budgets came out, the business community was happy, Labour was upset, and the other way around when the NDP are in government. So I, I'll be interested to see uh, the clips that uh, you got uh, uh, in the lockup there from the Labour side. Yeah, and the Labour folks are happy, as we'll see in a moment. But the business folks are not up in arms. And in fact, they're pretty happy that the budget is balanced. So let's take a look. We'll start with Laird Cronk, president of the BC Federation of Labour. And following that, Paul Farrow, president of the Canadian Union of Public Employees for BC. What's your thoughts from, from the Federation of Labour? Uh, I like it. I think they struck a strong balance. So the minister has increased taxes for those that can clearly afford it. Uh, pay a little bit more that make over $220,000. But they've taken that money and they put it back into people. They put it into services. So they're building on previous success. More importantly, I think they're building on, or as importantly, infrastructure, like physical infrastructure, which provides jobs. Jobs provide taxes. Jobs provide salaries. So uh, overall, good. Paul, you've been to uh, many, many budget lockups uh, with me. What did you see that you liked and what did you see that you might not have liked in this budget? Well, certainly uh, the infrastructure uh, that this government is is building is impressive. Uh, it, we have not seen that over over years and years. Uh, so that is, uh, that's something that every British Columbian, every CUPE member in the province certainly uh, is going to enjoy. Uh, you know, we're we're pleased that uh, there's continual funding funding in, in all of our sectors. Uh, we we still have concerns that funding is going into the elite uh, prep schools, private schools. We think the government should should re pull that funding back. And I'd say we're also concerned that not enough funding is going into public libraries, uh, something that we think would be a win-win for communities across the province. Uh, but the access grant for, for students, uh, people are going to get ahead. Uh, this, this government is doing uh, way more uh, good projects, good work for British Columbians compared to the last uh, government. Uh, the BC Liberals uh, certainly didn't care about British Columbians. So, Bill, you, you mentioned that the uh, business community was generally happy, but I would say I challenge you a little bit on that. I, I read quite a few clips, <laughs> and, and, I, and, I, and I know you did some interviews with some folks that, uh, while it may not have been kind of rabid and anger, but there's some concern around increased taxes. I know they're, they're talking about 22 or 23 new taxes being put in. Um, I've heard talk about the fact that this is a, a really a spend budget, that there's a, a lot more uh, money being spent, there's a lot more taxes coming in. It's not about growing the economy. That's, the I think, the general concern from the business community and from the BC Liberals that not enough focus is on growing the economy and more focus has been on, been put on taxes. I think that that does capture generally their, their sentiment. Well, from your perspective. From yeah. my perspective. <laughs> well, actually, I talked to three different representatives of business and I think I would say two things. I, I somewhat agree with you. They are quite happy that there is a, a balanced budget with a small surplus. Uh, they would like to see more done on competitiveness and a bit more of a vision for how business can, can move forward. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, there's concern about uh, the blockades that we've been seeing from Indigenous environmental mm -hmm. uh, folks and also uh, the challenge of the coronavirus mm -hmm. problem. So uh, those are three major issues, but um, my measuring stick, Daniel, is a bit different than yours. Perhaps. I have seen business light their hair on fire in that yeah, lockout I, before and with NDP governments, and that didn't happen. No, absolutely. I give you uh, full credit for that. Uh, you, you've definitely read that mood. Uh, <laughs> but I will, I will say that there are still, like I said, some general concerns. Yeah. I know you interviewed Bridget Anderson from mm -hmm. the uh, Greater Vancouver Board of Trade, and they always have their report card and their kind of thing. I think you were able to, to talk to her a little bit about that or got a shot on that. And I think it was at a, was it a B... 
minus grade or something like mm-hmm. that. So yeah, you're yeah. right. So yeah. for an NDP government to even get a B, B minus, minus is, is as good as it gets. That's like, you know, being in high school and getting that A plus, you know, it's like, you know, it was really a C. So, yeah. um, so I think g- generally speaking, there, there's some, some concern, but I think the business community also knows that this is not an election budget. So I think they're holding back somewhat in terms of some of their criticism and perhaps waiting for when people will be paying a little bit more attention, which will be likely when they're going to the polls next year. Yeah. Well, sense. let's actually take a look at those clips. Uh, first, I talked with Val Litwin. He's the CEO of the BC Chamber of Commerce. And then we talked to Bridget Anderson, the new CEO of the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade. And lastly, Greg Wilson, uh, representing Canadian retailers with concerns about getting goods in and out of the Port of Vancouver. What, uh, from a Chamber of Commerce perspective, what do you see here? You know, I mean, there are a couple of things there in terms of the economic fundamentals and good fiscal prudence we want to see. It was a balanced budget. That's fantastic. Um, we like the in- introduction of the BC Access Grant. I mean, for a, a membership base that's crying out for a skilled workforce to make sure we've got incentives to get that workforce to where we need them to be tomorrow is a good thing. What we were missing today was a strategy around competitiveness. One of the big missing pieces here, of course, for those big product producers, commodity exporters, is how do we help them compete internationally. BC now has one of the highest carbon taxes on planet Earth. And so we want to grow our opportunity here. We want to grow jobs. We want to grow revenue uh, for government so they can pay for those great social services. But we need to help our businesses compete. And that was a missing piece today. What would you have liked to have seen in the budget? Well, one of the things that we've been advocating for is a change in the employer health care tax, and we've been pretty vocal about that. But I think there can be other measures that also address innovation and address making this a more competitive region. We are hearing that, you know, there's there's concerns about uh, perceptions that BC is a difficult region to get business done in. And I think you look at what's happening in the last week or so, the movement of goods and people certainly impacted with those disruptions. We have 40 ships right now sitting in the Port of Vancouver waiting to be filled. So I think measures that encourage investment and encourage trade and also encourage higher earnings, which is what the budget, in fact, pointed out. But no, there were no measures really to address that. Do you expect more in next year's budget, given that it's an election year? (laughs) Well, will there be a budget next year? Well, there will be a budget, but will it be from this government? Who knows? Who knows? I mean, this really is a status quo budget. No, not a lot of surprises. And so for sure, we'll commend them on the fiscal prudent side. Absolutely. But what this government and I would say any future government needs to do is to address competitiveness and to make us the most competitive region, not only in Canada, but when we look at jurisdictions outside of Canada. I mean, we are trying to be, we are a global trading partner. We're trying to be more competitive. So how do we do that? We need uh, measures from government to increase trade investment. So, Greg, we've seen a lot of concern by the general public, by governments over the coronavirus spread and the impact on the economy. How is it impacting uh, BC retailers? So there are shortages of particularly thing products that disinfect the home and uh, masks. Um, it's a bit exacerbated by the blockades right now because a lot of this stuff comes in containers from overseas. But the, the cumulative impact of the two items would lead you to believe that the government's expectation of a 3% increase in retail sales in the coming year is not realistic. Yeah. You know, Daniel, every budget lockup, there is a flurry of excitement from the media around the key players, business, labor, any group that's really directly affected negatively uh, by the budget. What I wanted to do and what you wanted to do at BC Polytalk is talk to people who actually have something to say but can't draw the attention of the bigger media. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did while I was over there uh, with our camera operator. We talked to everybody we possibly could. We got a lot of news releases. Mm -hmm. And one of the groups that was probably the most critical that we talked to was uh, Greater Vancouver Family Services. They are really not happy about the lack of increases for funding for uh, social services, for uh, disability benefits, um, things that the government has increased in the past, but isn't increasing in this budget. Yeah, when, as I said, there really are three groups. There's labor, uh, there's uh, business, and then there's the other. And the other is kind of the social services sector. So you look at uh, the folks who are calling for more, the $10 a day uh, childcare, the fact that there wasn't the rental subsidy in the budget that people Mm -hmm. wanted. Um, You have the Greater Vancouver uh, Family Services uh, talking about the lack of funding there. So there was actually quite a few social services groups that were out uh, critical. Now, they're probably a little less critical of an NDP government than they would be of a BC Liberal government. But nonetheless, they they point out some areas that, especially because there's a surplus in this budget, it's not like it's running a deficit, there's some money left on the table, they would have preferred that would have been committed to social causes in the province. Yeah, and we started off with Carol James talking about how budgets are choices, and that's always true. So let's hear some of that criticism of the budget from Bree Hamilton from Family Services of Greater Vancouver. 
Bree, what did you see in this budget in terms of the interests of your organization? Well, Family Services of Greater Vancouver is a really large social services organization and we serve a wide range of clients from homeless youth to single mothers to children, families, kids with developmental disabilities. So we're looking at this budget as holistically. Um, how is it moving the needle for our most vulnerable citizens? And we have found this year to be very flat. Right. We weren't hoping that, you know, just because it was second year and a three year mandate that it was going to be so flat. They didn't move the needle at all, really. And do you see that partly as cautiousness or a reflection of the economy and the slowdown of the economy? How, how do you interpret it? Well, I'd align with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives in that I think this is too cautious a budget. Um, I think we should be, the surplus is uh, there, especially in a, in a time when um, interest rates are relatively low, that we should be investing more in social services. So a little disappointing for you. Very, very much so. Yeah, I think they really could have moved the needle for homeless youth, especially all their investments in homelessness are not for youth. Yeah, great. Okay, thanks very much thanks for your time. Thanks so much, Bill. So, Bill, uh, interestingly, one of the things that came out of this budget is uh, carbonated pop. Uh, interestingly, that is one of the big issues uh, besides the tax on the high income earners. Uh, the pop tax came out and I think there was some initial confusion as to whether or not it would apply to because they were calling it sugary pop and sugary drinks are going to be taxed. But uh, I, I had a chance to chat with the minister uh, uh, this week and confirmed that, uh, in fact, it's all pop. So it's not just uh, sugary pop. So someone like me who drinks a uh, diet pop or Diet Coke or Coke Zero, I'm now going to be paying tax on top of, of what I'm paying for my pop. So I, for me, look, it's not a huge issue. It's not something I feel like I'm going to die on. But I look at the fact that uh, does this change behavior? Does this actually uh, make people not buy pop? And I'm not that terribly convinced that it does. And I know there's some advocates in the province who have been working very hard to make that tax change. I'm just not convinced that putting 7% PST will do anything but tax people who otherwise would just be buying pop and they'll continue to buy pop regardless. Well, you're such a populist. <laughs> I, I, uh, oh, yeah. I had to use that. That was uh, a good line. Well, actually, it is a pretty serious problem, Daniel. And, you know, there is the Childhood Obesity Foundation. They've been working on this for a long time. I talked to Tom Warshowski from that foundation and let's let him explain why it's important to them because they worked on this for a long time. Well, what we do is we are a uh, registered charity and our goal is to identify, evaluate, and then disseminate or spread the best practices in the reduction of child and overweight and obesity. So we work at both the provincial level here, we work with the government around programs to help kids who are on unhealthy weight trajectory get a healthy weight, but we also work on a pan-Canadian level. Uh, one of the things that we've done is work with our coalition partners to help government work towards reducing the marketing of unhealthy foods and beverages to kids. What other measures were you uh, hoping to see or did you see in this budget that would address the issues of your foundation? Well, this is a good step in the right direction. For the last seven years, we've been before the Select Standing Committee on Finance and Health, advocating for a removal of the exemption that sugary drinks have had from the PST. So, Bill, uh, one of the things that came out of the budget was something called BC Access Grants, which I think is great. Um, it's looking to provide students with some uh, relief in terms of tuition fees, which we know we're facing labor shortages across the province here. It doesn't matter who you're talking to, can't find enough labor. So I think that probably was well received by some of the student groups that you spoke to in the budget lockup. Oh, yeah, it's worth 41 million a year. It's needs based grants. So. Uh, students who really want to go to a university or post-secondary institute to further their education uh, now have an opportunity to access that money. And it's something that the student groups have been working for for a long time. So students are happy. And I talked to two different groups. Uh, first, we'll watch Janelle Davies from the BC Federation of Students. And then we'll talk to Shanti Scarpetta-Lee, and she's with the Alliance of BC Students. All right, we're seeing the implementation of a grants program in BC. It's called mm -hmm. the BC Access Grant. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that BC students have been advocating for for over 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll see the first um, kind of non-repayable student financial assistance for students in British Columbia, which is really exciting. And what kind of difference would that make for British Columbia students and their parents, oh. particularly ones like me who paid a lot of money? <laughs> yes, it's going to make a huge difference. When I was going back to school, it certainly that was one of those things I was considering of where I went. Mm -hmm. And um, as somebody who's currently repaying my student loan off, even though I'm in a good unionized work environment, uh, and I'm 
in a better privileged position than most, um, having that non-repayable financial aid while you're going to school takes off a lot of the stresses that you face while you're trying to complete your studies. And then afterwards, when you're also trying to work in the economy, um, buy a house, look at, look at buying a car, all of those sorts of things that are ec economic drivers for the community. It's a good first step, um, and we'll, we look forward to seeing the implementation in the fall. Great. Thanks yeah. for your time. Thank you. Okay. So, Shanti, uh, BC Budget 2020 has some interesting moves on students uh, and, and uh, grants and loans. Can you tell us a little bit about what your reaction is to that? Yeah, well, the Alliance of, of BC Students has been working on um, getting needs-based needs grants uh, since we were founded in, in, in 2013. So it's something that we've been really advocating hard for for the past seven years. Um, so it's something we're really, really happy to, to see the BC Access Grant coming forward this year. Um, we think it's, it's going to make post-secondary education a lot more accessible and affordable for a lot of, of students. So we're really, really happy to see that. Another group that's very concerned about the budget each year is the Child Care Coalition and Sharon Gregson, uh, who's been uh, absolutely the energizer bunny of uh, $10 a child care, yes. was there again. I spoke with her in the clip we're going to see. Um, there's more funding, which was previously promised. Mm -hmm. So it's funding that was supposed to be there, but it's not more funding than was supposed to be there. Yeah, I think uh, I did see some of the, the clips from Sharon. And I think, uh, again, I'll, I'll just add, if if it was a BC Liberal government, I have a feeling Sharon would have been a lot more vocal and critical of, mm -hmm. of the, the lack of funding there, for, in particular for $10 a day uh, child care. But you know, I, I think uh, Sharon has done, I think, the political thing, and she did make her comments about some concern. She was trying to balance and make sure that she did echo some concern, but definitely not as critical as I thought she could have been. Yeah. So let's hear directly from Sharon Gregson from the Coalition of Child Care Advocates of BC. What's your response to this year's budget? So I'm glad to hear that childcare is still being prioritized by this government. That's very clear. This budget includes $88 million, new money for childcare. Um, that's good news. It's year three of their three-year commitment. They've followed through 100% on their commitment. Um, that's all good news. Of course, we're looking to see what happens next. We want to make sure that building a system ramps up on that spending, and it matters how the money is spent. We want to see new spaces. We want them to be $10 a day spaces, and we want to see investments in early childhood educators. And in terms of $10 a day childcare, are we making progress? Are we getting close? Are we, what, what's the status? So we are making progress. There are now 28,000 families in British Columbia that are paying $10 a day or less for their childcare. There are prototypes of the 10 a day plan that we call for. Um, there's an affordability benefit, which is like an income tested subsidy for families. There's a fee reduction initiative. So a lot of measures to make childcare more affordable. Uh, it's still not enough. There's so much catch up to do after decades of childcare chaos. But this government is uh, achieving what they said they wanted to do in year three. Thanks very much, Sharon. And you know, Daniel, there's another big issue playing out on the budget floor. That's the issue of the dispute between teachers and their employers, the school trustees. So I spoke to both Terry Mooring, who's the president of BC Teachers Federation, about her view, and also to Stephanie Higginson, who's the president of the BC School Trustees Association, to see whether the two sides are going to get together, whether we might have a teacher strike, and what the future holds. You've seen the BC budget here. Uh, we heard Minister James say that there is no additional money for teachers. Um, how do you respond to that? Are you, were you expecting, not expecting that answer? Well, we haven't heard anything today that we haven't heard before. We understand there's a mandate. We're working within it to try and get a deal, and so that's not new. We're encouraged that uh, you know the increased student enrollment has been funded, uh, the increased number of students with special needs being funded. That's all good news to us. Uh, what we are concerned about is the uh, really significant significant teacher shortage at uh, NBC right now. We have hundreds of uncertified folks in classrooms. Uh, Prince George, one of the biggest districts in the north, uh, is advertising for enthusiastic individuals with or without post-secondary degrees. And so that is a sign that the shortage is worsening. And we're, we have a lot of concerns about that. It manifests as Metro as well. What we see is specialist teachers pulled into classrooms. It used to be day to day, and now it's for contract positions. So those supports are removed from students uh, that really need them. And so we're really concerned about that. And it has to be dealt with. Our low salary doesn't help, second lowest nationally. And we're also overall underfunded in BC from the previous government. They underfunded the system dramatically. And so we're still seeing that we're $1,800 per student funded less than the national average. These all have impacts on the system. 
And lastly, to bargaining, what's your timetable at this point? Right now, we're uh, in mediation through March. That's good news. Uh, we're certainly hoping that we get a deal. Uh, we're going to work as hard as we can to achieve that. Um, that's the expectations, and, um, and that's what we're going to try and do. And are you at all worried that as bargaining continues without a resolution so far, there could be, we've seen some signs of political instability with the Green Party uh, leader, Andrew Weaver, leaving. We could be into an election. That would really seem to me to be a real um, obstacle for getting a deal if there was a, an election sometime this year. We, we could, you know, we could be in that situation. Um, and so what we would encourage government to do is encourage their bargaining team to make sure they get a deal with us. We certainly are interested in getting one. Great. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Do you have any concern that with a minority, tight minority government and, you know, a little bit of instability and, and rumors of a possible election this year, that an election could interfere with the bargaining process? Well, I don't think so. I think we have a, a government that's committed to settling, you know, as we've seen with many of the other public sector employee groups. And I think that we can continue the work even if something happens. Um, and we can continue to work under the current, the current contract if something like that was to happen. But I think both parties are committed, at least from our side, we're very committed to wrapping this up and having a fully negotiated settlement as soon as we can. Of course, Bill, we couldn't talk about a BC budget without talking about ICBC, and we definitely have to interview the Canadian Taxpayers Federation because we know they always have some comments around the additional taxes. So I think you had a chance to interview, I think, David Black and Chris Sims as well. So what was their reaction? Well, first of all, yeah, you're right. We can't miss the dumpster fire of ICBC. But since uh, or just before this budget came out, the government announced it would go to no fault, and that should cut about $400 uh, per vehicle in terms of the ICBC rate. So it's kind of a way to to, um, at, if not douse completely, dampen down the dumpster fire. Mm -hmm. So we talked with uh, Move Up President David Black. He's responsible for workers at ICBC, among others. And then, uh, yes, I talked to Chris Sims from the Canadian Tax Rates Federation. Uh, one of my nemesis has been the CTF from time to time. I tend to find them pretty libertarian in their views, and they'll say that if they're off the record. Um, uh, but Chris is very concerned about something which is worth talking about, and that's the level of debt that's increasing. Mm -hmm. She's unhappy it's going uh, up. Um, the minister actually responded to that in a way by saying that debt to GDP is very, very manageable, one of the lowest in the country. Mm -hmm. But uh, we'll hear Chris Sims about that too. Yeah, and I think what Chris was trying to say is that it really, uh, she agrees with the, the minister that in terms of the, the Canadian context, we're doing pretty good, but it's trends and where are we going? And I think the concern even from some of the business community is that uh, for the last three years that that trend is starting to go up. And that's that's a bit of an alarm bell for many yeah, people. Yeah. So let's go first to David Black, president of Move Up, and we'll follow that directly with a clip from Chris Sims from the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, BC. Move Up is a union that, among other things, represents workers at uh, Insurance Corporation of BC. How do you feel about the budget today and what's been happening, uh, what, what Minister James said about ICBC? So for, from our point of view, this confirms what we've been saying all along, that public auto insurance, when managed properly, provides a real benefit to British Columbians. What, what we've been told in the last couple of weeks is that premiums will be going down for, for British Columbians and care is going to go up. What our job is now is to make sure that that, that promise is delivered. What's the position of the union at ICBC on no fault? Well, we've talked to our colleagues who work in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, who both have a similar model as the one that's being brought in British Columbia. They say that they are able to provide the services to the drivers that drivers need when they're injured in car accidents. So we take some comfort from that. They've, they uh, have provided a model that works for people in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. So we'd like to see that followed as closely as possible here in British Columbia. Chris, you've been to many budget lockups and you have a different perspective from the Canadian Taxpayers Federation than many of the groups here who want to see more spending. You generally tend to want to see less spending. Um, I'm guessing you are at least happy that the budget is balanced and with a small surplus. We're happy to see the operating budget balanced with mm -hmm. a very, very small surplus. Interestingly, I would call it paper thin this year and tissue paper thin next mm -hmm. year. It's mm -hmm. almost a rounding error. It's mm -hmm. a scary small surplus for next year. But I wanted to stress that's just the operating budget. Mm -hmm. Our debt, mm -hmm. our real debt is going up at a pretty alarming pace, mm -hmm. about 17 and a half billion dollars over just three years. Mm -hmm. And our debt to revenue ratio, that mm -hmm. was interesting. Right mm -hmm. now we're in about the 70s. Mm -hmm. It's going up to 94% mm -hmm. by the mm -hmm. end of this fiscal plan. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of dough and yeah. we're going to have to eventually pay for that. So while they do have a balanced operating budget, the debt is getting way deeper, way faster. BC Polytalk thanks Harbour Air for supporting this show. It's through sponsorship and viewer support that we get to produce this show.
So Bill, uh, we've now heard from all the, uh, the various folks, the stakeholders, so uh, maybe take just a few minutes just to talk about our general impression and wrap up the special mm -hmm. edition of BC Polytalk. Uh, I will say that my general overall impression is that the, the government, I think, was trying to make sure that it didn't anger too many people. Uh, it didn't kind of please everyone. So it kind of ran, tried to run right through the center. And I think it, you and I have talked about this on, on this show before is that one of the, the concerns of any NDP government is is whether they're going to get criticized for spending too much or, you know, those types of criticisms, I think, are very, they're very sensitive to. And I think these types of budgets are, they're trying to bring this in to make sure that they go into the next election without that criticism. So I, I will, before I, I throw it over to you, I will say that uh, what I did find fascinating was in the day after the budget, uh, which is the question period that followed the budget, typically mm -hmm. you'll always have in the legislature a series of questions around things in the budget and not a single question from the budget uh, from the Liberal opposition or the Greens. So I don't know if you... If you yeah, no, that's quite amazing actually because you do see that. And uh, in the budget lockup, I was talking with several people there and I just said, to, I think to Keith Baldry at Global, like, I just don't see where the Liberals can go with this budget. There isn't a lot to criticize. Do you defend the 1%, the richest British Columbians in the province? Yeah. I would tend to play to Andrew Wilkinson's weak point. Mm -hmm. uh, the pop tax, you're like, you know, really, who cares that much about it? Yeah. Uh, the budget is balanced. There's a small surplus. Uh, social spending's going up. Health spending's going up quite a bit to mm -hmm. 22 billion. And uh, it doesn't leave a lot of ground for them to attack. I suspect that the next budget will have some larger spending in it and there'll be some goodies as we mm -hmm. traditionally see in an election year budget. And that's what Carol James was saving the money for. Yeah, and I, but the only caution I'd put on that is we've got two major things happening right now. One is the uh, whole issue around the blockades and mm -hmm. the we've got 40 ships out in the harbor. There's a lot of concern around the economic impact of the blockades, mm -hmm. which don't seem like they're going to be ending anytime soon. And then you add to that the coronavirus and the impact of the coronavirus. And I think when I looked at the budget, although it's really hard to forecast these things those are two major things that could have a real drawdown on the BC economy mm -hmm. coming at a time when the government's going into election and will need some of that budget room to be able to actually hand out the goodies so I'll be watching that over the next 12 months to see yeah. whether or not the uh, updates on the budget and the forecast are showing a little bit of a downward uh, tick yeah. Well, and you know, Carol James was asked by media about the coronavirus and she said, you know, we're watching it, we're concerned, but you know, we're not seeing that. I guess the other piece though, Daniel, is timing is everything in politics and having a 2% growth rate may not sound like a lot by and large, but it's still leading the country. And so the BC NDP have been the beneficiaries of a pretty good economy mm -hmm. and they've been very careful to not screw it up mm -hmm. uh, for sure. And I think Carol James is very cautious in the budget. I think what we'll see, uh, the other piece is you don't want to have a sudden election this year. So uh, I think Andrew Weaver, the former Green Party leader, giving assurance that he would follow through on the CAS agreement uh, before the budget was another important piece. Um, but we'll see. Like you know, it's BC politics, and anything yeah, can happen. Anything can happen, and you look at things like you know, you and I kind of joke a little bit about the pop tax and the Netflix tax. But you know, for the average British Columbian, uh, you know, I've had a, a lot of people even in the last few hours uh, since the budget's come out said, I don't want to pay my Netflix tax. No, there's not going to be a revolt. But it's every time you're paying your Netflix, you're reminded that you're now paying an additional tax. So sometimes these small things can have a way of, you know, kind of eating away at the government support. And remember, the NDP have to increase the total number of seats that they have in the that's next true. election. And that's a really hard thing to do in any election to grow your majority term after term. But right? that's one of the reasons why they eliminated the medical service premium. So if you're going to put on the one hand Netflix tax, pop tax on a 1% tax, on the other hand, you got rid of MSP premiums for a large number of British Columbians. I'll take that. Yeah, you take the MSP premiums, but you layer on the fact that with the strata property insurance, which we've talked about on this program, on this podcast, people are looking at facing three, four, five hundred dollars more a month if you're renting. And 50% of people are renting or in condos in the metro area. That MSP uh, removal is going to be completely wiped out by this uh, strata insurance issue unless that's properly dealt with and there was no mention of that in the budget at all obviously because we don't know where that's going to go you're not even at a b minus yet I think, <laughs> I think i have more work to do here and so to end this special on the bc budget let's have a few more words from finance minister carol james about her budget so to wrap up when we were elected as i said at the start as a government we set out with a plan with people at the heart of our work every single day a budget is a reflection of that our plan is working and we're sticking to it. Budget 2020 is all about building on the progress that we've made so far. New measures to keep life affordable. New investments in schools, hospitals and roads. That results in better services and thousands of good jobs. 
and in training programs to make sure that people have the opportunity to be able to access those good jobs and that we have the opportunity to grow a sustainable economy. So this really is a budget that builds a stronger British Columbia, not for the few at the top, but in fact for all British Columbians. So thank you for being here today and I look forward to your questions when I come back. Thank you. And remember, you can find everything at our website, bcpolytalk.ca. You can also chase us down on Spotify and iTunes for podcasts. You can find us on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook and find links there. You can go to YouTube and see the show.